on Inside the Issues, I speak to James Manicon about Canada-Australia's security cooperation in the Asia-Pacific region. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and program officer at the Balsley School of International Affairs. Every week on the show, we invite an expert in the areas of international public policy, global governance, or some other aspect of international affairs here to the studio at the Centre for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo. Today I'm joined by Dr. James Manicom. Dr. Manicom is a research fellow here at CG. He's an authority on East Asian international relations, on Arctic security and governance, and on maritime security and governance. He's also a contributor to a new project that CG has undertaken in partnership with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute on Canada-Australia security cooperation in the Asia-Pacific region. James, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I thought we'd start the episode by talking a little bit about the project. And the broad aims are to explore ways in which Canada and Australia can enhance their partnership, particularly in the area of defense and security cooperation yes, in is. Asia Pacific. Um, can you speak a little bit about the project, its scope, and what the intended outcomes might be? Yeah, we, uh, the project uh, is uh, going to produce a report for the Australia-Canada Economic Leadership Forum which is a, uh, uh, a biannual meeting of, of industry, of government, of the private sector. Uh, that takes place alternating between Canada and Australia. Uh, and they talk about Australia, the scope of Australia and Canadian political and economic cooperation. And there's a lot of companies that do business in, in, in both countries, and, and the two economies are both complementary and competitive in different ways, in mining and in services and things like that. Anyway, the forum uh, has asked CG, uh, uh, and particularly Ben Hampson, our Director of Global Security, uh, to, to, to produce a report that looks at security cooperation, because they don't often talk about the security dimension of the Australia-Canada relationship, which is, um, I think, one of the underexplored areas of possible cooperation between Canada and Australia, who are so similar in so many ways. So that's where the impetus came from. We partnered, we looked for an Australian uh, uh, partner or a peer think tank uh, uh, to CG that could help us work on the Australian end. We came up with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, or ASPE, uh, who are based in, in, in Canberra and uh, uh, focus primarily on security and defense stuff, procurement issues, uh, Asia-Pacific security, those kinds of things. So in cooperation with Peter Jennings, who's their, uh, their, uh, their executive director, I think he's called, uh, it's his title, uh, uh, we've had two meetings um, so far, one in Singapore, where we convened a meeting between Australian experts, Canadian experts, uh, as well as some experts from Southeast Asia uh, uh, at the Shangri-La Hotel in Singapore, right after the Shangri-La Dialogue, which is a very important uh, track 1.5 security meeting in the region. We piggybacked off that and had a very productive meeting uh, to discuss security cooperation between Canada and Australia in Southeast Asia. And then in, we met again in Seoul in October uh, and had a meeting uh, hosted by a Korean think tank called the Asan Institute about Canada, Australia, and Korean cooperation uh, uh, in Northeast Asia and exploring the Northeast Asian uh, element of, of, of security, bringing in experts also from Japan, uh, uh, Korea, and China to that, to that meeting. So the meetings have been, been quite good. Our next step is to write up a report, which, which we're in the final stages of doing. Uh, we'll vet that. We'll get a, we'll circulate around to all of our participants um, and try to uh, look for as many different ways for Canada and Australia to cooperate in the security defined broadly uh, uh, realm as possible. And uh, we'll launch the report in February uh, at the, uh, the 2014 meeting of the forum uh, in Melbourne with a bit of a teaser event uh, before that at the uh, Canadian Association of Defense, the Canadian Conference of Defense Associations, excuse me, meeting in February right. um, in Ottawa. And for our audience, um, historically, what has the relationship between Canada and Australia been particularly, although not exclusively, in the area of security cooperation? Well, as I said, I mean, there, the relationship, we have a lot of, com we compete with Australia in some ways. We both produce uh, natural resources. We are both, our economies are based on digging things out of the ground and selling them to, to other markets. Australia's got a leg up on Canada uh, in Asia for certain because Australia has always been sort of pointed, um, uh, both at the UK, but also economically, it's always been pointed at Asia. They began selling coal to the Japanese in the 1960s. And so it's no, it was really easy for them to, to begin selling coal or whatever else to South Korea and now China. So they're quite 
they're quite ahead of us in East Asia. When it comes to services, uh, their banks and our banks uh, compete in common areas. We're probably a little bit more advanced on, on advanced manufacturers like avionics via Bombardier. Um, but there's a, a, a great deal of economic complementarity and competitiveness there. Politically, we're almost the same country in a lot of ways. We've, you know, both Commonwealth countries, both democracies, we're both liberal countries. Um, I think we're probably, <coughs> excuse me, we're probably one generation more multicultural than they are in as much as Canadian immigration began almost a generation earlier. Um, but we're, we're, we're similar in so many different ways. The security area is an area where we really haven't discussed in a meaningful way ways to formalize cooperation. We, we cooperate with undefense in a lot of ways because we're, we're both part of what they call the Five Eyes um, intelligence network of U.S. allies, English-speaking allies, including the United States, U.K., and New Zealand. So we share intelligence quite, quite readily, almost to the point where we divide the labor, right? So if the Australians want intelligence on, say, Mexico or Brazil, which is sort of what we do well, we could provide it to them, whereas if we need intelligence on, say, you know, China or Japan or South Korea, thing or North Korea, that are more in their neck of the woods, um, we can sort of compare notes and almost share the burden that way. That's how close that intelligence relationship is, and, and that's, that's a big deal, because countries don't share its secrets uh, uh, easily. Uh, but beyond that, there's also a military dimension. We've participated in similar military exercises. We fought alongside one another in World War I, II, Korea. Uh, Australia did participate formally in Vietnam. We didn't. Um, that's where we sort of started to, to diverge. But there is an ingrained sort of military respect for one another, and we, we share officers and go back and forth. And uh, that's always been very easy. Uh, because Canada and Australia trust each other and are very similar. Um, what we're trying to do is try to find new ways for us to cooperate because the Asia-Pacific region, as I'll discuss later, is, is, is becoming less secure. It's clear that the Kenyan government wants to trade with Asia to diversify our trading partners away from the U.S., which is stagnant. Australia it already trades quite a, a, great, a great deal with them. And so there are ways that we can cooperate to make Asia more secure and stable and to improve the economic prospects for both Canada and Australia. Thank you very much, James. We'll be back in a moment with Dr. James Manicom. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back. James, I wonder if we could uh, focus the discussion on the Asia Pacific region, which of course is one of the, the great drivers of the global economy right now, but it's also an incredibly volatile region. And I wonder if you could talk about some of the security threats, both traditional threats and non-traditional threats that could destabilize the region. Yeah, sure. Um, how much time do you have? Um, no, the, uh, Asia, I think the first thing you recognize about Asia, Asia is enormous and it's diverse. Um, I mean, Asia, defined broadly, can include everything from Afghanistan to Fiji, all right? Everything from the north of Russia down to the tip, the southern tip of Australia. Uh, over half the world's population lives there. Uh, it's an incredibly diverse part of the world. Uh, it's also a part of the world that has had inconsistent different experiences with colonialism, with uh, national, with with uh, revolution movements, um, national self determination, uh, uh, over 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 thousands of years. I mean, Asia is very much a region that identifies itself as very old, right? Whereas in Canada, we typically define ourselves as being 150, 200 years old, maybe. Um, so that's the first point. The, the result of that is that there's a great deal of, of competitive pressure. Built into the in, in, into the into the region uh, as a function of this different history, so you've got a country like China, for instance, which traces its 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 lineage back five thousand years, but at the same time, for much of that time, it was ruled by non-Chinese people, whether they're Manchurian, Mongolian, or colonized by the Japanese. Uh, likewise, you've got a country like Korea that's sandwiched between China and Japan, and basically, it's at one point or another in its history was always paying tribute uh, to one of the other. It was never a very strong country. You go down to Southeast Asia, you've got, you've got countries uh, that were colonized by the British, and, by the Dutch and the Portuguese and the French, uh, who were decolonized in a, in, a, in a relatively peaceful but sometimes violent way. And what you've got now is countries whose boundaries reflect very creative definitions of the state, right? Malaysia is divided between East and West. Indonesia is composed of 16,000 different islands. Singapore is a city state. So it's a very complex region. Uh, as a function of that, you've got, uh, you've got a number of, of sources of, of tension in the contemporary era. Uh, one of those 
um, is, I should add, as a function of the Cold War, the United States is the what they call the hegemon, the regional power. Um, it has military bases in Japan, uh, military bases in South Korea, military bases in Guam. It has an alliance with Thailand. It has access arrangements. We can drive its ships into Singapore pretty easily. Uh, and now it, it, China doesn't like that because China, uh, for a long time, sensitive to those, 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 those penetrations by other countries and other empires over the course of its history, is now reasserting itself because, you know, the Chinese nation for the first time is economically strong. Um, uh, uh, so that's the first sort of, source of tension is that U.S.-China rivalry, right? I think the Chinese probably resent the fact the United States uh, is in the region. It can do certain things off the Chinese coast that the Chinese don't like, uh, which the Americans argue it's perfectly, uh, they are perfectly entitled to do. Uh, at the same time, you've got a, a, Chinese, a China that is very strong, but also a little bit insecure. Uh, not insecure because it fears invasion. I don't think the Chinese, country, the Chinese government fears the invasion of China. Uh, it's insecure because China, on any given day, is on the brink of collapse, right? It's one, there are 1.4 billion people in that country that have to get up every day, uh, live under the yoke of authoritarian government, go about their business, make money, uh, 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 and, and be, be secure and safe, which is a new condition for a lot of these people, right? Uh, the Cultural Revolution was a time when that just wasn't the case. So the Chinese government is not terribly secure that it can meet these expectations every day. Uh, and the result is you've got a, a Chinese government that, uh, um, uh, for whatever reason, they've decided that the best way to maintain their unity is to distract the Chinese citizenry uh, uh, with foreign policy crises, which is why I think you see China acting a little bit more, people would call it assertive, against Taiwan, against the Philippines, Vietnam, and Japan, which are countries with which it has uh, sovereignty disputes over islands at sea, <coughs> which is our, our next point of tension. These, these sovereignty disputes are a function not only of, of these unsettled historical rivalries, uh, but also a function of emerging international norms and laws. The, the law of the sea, which came into effect in 1994, basically makes any island, any interpretation of the countries that signed it, which is almost everybody in Asia, uh, except for Cambodia, uh, North Korea uh, makes any rock or island more important than it would be otherwise because you can claim more space, you can drill for oil, you can catch fish. And most of East Asia uh, is reliant on fish in some way or another for fish protein. Um, I often tell the Chinese and the Japanese that while they're, they like to eat fish, there are countries in Southeast Asia that have to eat fish. It's the only way kind of protein they get because of the virtue, the virtue of their geography. Um, so there's, that's those, you'd call those traditional security challenges, right? They're interstate. Uh, and, and they're a function of, of, of state policy, uh, for, for more or less. Um, there's also a host of non, what we call non true security uh, uh, challenges, which is a, the term that we started to use in academia when human security fell out of, of, out of favor. Um, and these are uh, threats that originate, originate from non-individual human action. I wouldn't say they're independent of human action, because of course climate change is one of them, which is of course a function of human behavior, or a product of human behavior. Um, but, th but the region is vulnerable to all kinds of natural disasters, pollution, uh, water conflicts, um, all kinds of things, energy insecurity, food insecurity, uh, that, that lead to uh, destabilizing, destabilizing behaviors from countries. So if countries think something is scarce, they'll begin to hoard, they'll, they'll exacerbate the problem, which we saw with food prices after 2008. You see that with, with energy sometimes in, in East Asia, where prices go up because countries are hoarding supplies. Um, but you've also got a collective action problem there because these are countries that, if they cooperated together, could mitigate some of the effects of these things. Um, you see that with the typhoon, uh, typhoon Hainan slash Yolanda that hit the Philippines. That's a classic climate change driven, driven, driven problem. There, is, there are mechanisms regionally to improve the response to natural disasters under the ASEAN Regional Forum, but because of the nature of the interstate relationship between these countries, there's not a lot of trust, those forums those mechanisms don't always work. In this case, it didn't work. Um, ASEAN was not able to respond to the typhoon in a timely fashion. And the result is you've got the United States, thank goodness, that comes in with all of its Navy ships and begins to alleviate uh, the suffering in the region. So you've got sort of two kinds of problems, interstate problems that are built on rivalries and history and territory, and non-traditional problems that are based on sort of, you know, uh, uh, collective action problems. Um, so there's a lot, there are a lot of problems to solve when it comes to Asia Pacific security. Right. Thank you very much, James. We'll be back in a moment. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.
Welcome back to the program. James, I wonder if we might pick up on some things you touched on in the last segment of the show, specifically the roles of China and the U.S. in the Asia-Pacific region. To what extent are they rivals, uh, or conversely, to what extent are they partners in helping to ensure that there is regional stability? That's a good question. And of course, you know, the answer is, is they're both. Um, in some of the traditional security uh, uh, stuff, they are decidedly rivals, even if they don't talk about it. Um, I mentioned those territorial disputes that China has with the Philippines, with Vietnam, and with Japan. The United States is a formal military ally to the Philippines and Japan. Uh, uh, and it's bound by a treaty to defend those countries if they're, if they're subject to aggression. Uh, and there's all kinds of debates right now as to what aggression means and, and the circumstances under which the United States would come to the aid of the Philippines or Japan. Because, of course, the United States doesn't want to fight China. Nobody wants to fight China. No one wants to fight the United States um, either. Uh, so in the context of the traditional uh, security s side of things, the United States is certainly um, uh, perceived by the Chinese to be a potential rival. Um, I would also suggest, though, that you know, given some of the things that China has done in recent, in recent months, the United States also might be the only thing keeping the Chinese from running roughshod over, particularly the Philippines, which is not a very capable military country. Um, on the non-traditional side, I think ultimately they're partners. Uh, using the ASEAN Regional Forum, uh, the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus, which is a, a meeting of ASEAN Defense Ministers, which is that group of 10 Southeast Asian countries, plus uh, their partner countries, including China, Japan, South Korea, and the United States, um, there's a, a considerable degree of scope for cooperation and, uh, between them. Um, they, because of their broader, the broader mistrust and relationship, formal military exercises between the United States and the, Chi and the Chinese are, are, are outlawed by U.S. law. However, they can engage in search and rescue and humanitarian, uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief exercises uh, in multilateral settings, which is what they can do uh, under ASEAN, which is important when you get things like Typhoon Yolanda or the, or the, the, the tsunami that hit Asia in 2004. Right? You want to be able to speak to other militaries as you're all approaching the same area to provide assistance. Right? Um, having said that, uh, even, the, even though they're, they're nominally partners in this area, there is an underlying mistrust uh, between the two of them bilaterally that I think makes them hesitant to get too far into you know, cooperation on the non-traditional security side. And that's because within the region, uh, beyond the U.S. treaty commitments to its allies and beyond uh, uh, the non-traditional security stuff, there are a few just bilateral issues between the two. One is, is the issue of, of um, freedom of navigation, which the United States argues is a universal norm. That's why they can drive their ships through the Northwest Passage if, if they want to. Um, uh, and every country who's ever been subject to a U.S. expression of this norm under, is told that this is not a, a bilateral concern. This is a global concern for the U.S. Navy. Uh, the Chinese don't accept this any more than we accept this, and they don't like the fact that the, China, that the United States Navy is capable of driving ships off the side of the Chinese, uh, off the Chinese coast, conduct intelligence operations, who knows what they do there, uh, do mapping on the sea floor. The Chinese have passed laws that say that's, that's illegal. So that's one uh, a, a, a bilateral dispute. The other, the other concern is that the United States has, and I think every country in the world has arguably, is on the potential escalation of these territorial disputes, right? Because there is a considerable amount of, of, uh, of commerce that travels through the South China Sea, through the East China Sea, uh, on its way to Japan or China, Australia in particular. Right? A great deal of Australia's exports, I think probably 70% of Australia's total exports at least, go to Japan, South Korea, and China, right up straight through the, East, through, through the Indonesian archipelago uh, 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 and skirting the South China Sea and through the East China Sea. So that's, it's, it's everyone's concern, and particularly a U.S. concern, that these disputes not escalate in a way that impedes the, you know, the free passage of commerce. So you've mentioned there are regional governance mechanisms in place that, at least in theory, should help mitigate mm. some of these, these threats or tensions. How would you gauge their effectiveness? Boy, that's also a million dollar question. I think the, um, the governance mechanisms, their existence is an expression of of the willingness by regional governments to get along, or at least not escalate. So China and the South China Sea claimants in ASEAN uh, 
uh, declared a made a declaration on a code of conduct in 2002 where they said we're not going to escalate by doing the following things. So they, they're outlying deviant behavior, which is, I suppose, a good thing. Then, of course, over the next five, six years, everyone engaged in the kind of deviant behavior they wouldn't so they say they're going to do while well, pointing the finger at the other one uh, for starting it all. Uh, so countries have made promises to do certain things, but then when they perceive that other countries are breaking those promises, they engage in the same behavior. The new, the new uh, uh, pressure now is on, is on China and ASEAN to conclude a formal code of conduct, which would be a binding mechanism um, that would define deviant behavior, would punish deviant behavior, would be, it, would be, it would be a legally binding document. Um, uh, the problem is that ASEAN and China have very different uh, interpretations of, of just how pressing that is. For ASEAN, it's vitally important. The Chinese are, are a little more uh, uh, gradual in, the, in their approach. So you've got a, a disagreement on just the pace of even building the mechanism um, in addition to whether the mechanism should exist at all. Um, so that's on, on the South China Sea itself. Problematically, you know, in the East China Sea, uh, there, are, there is not a lot of, of communication between, between China and Japan on this. There is a little between militaries and things, but there isn't any kind of multilateral security mechanism in Northeast Asia. Uh, the only thing that comes close is the six-party talks, which is, has a very limited agenda of trying to denuclearize the, the the, the Korean Peninsula, um, and certainly I don't think China or Japan would want a role for Russia in, in you know, defining maritime codes of conduct in the East China Sea. Um, uh, so Northeast Asia is particularly afflicted by a, by a, a, um, a lack of, of regional security governance, which I think is for, uh, for organizations, like, or organizations like ours is a bit of a concern, because um, uh, there is from time to time, more governance isn't always better, but some governance is always good. And I think in Northeast Asia, there's not a, enough security governance when it comes to managing their issues. Great. Thank you very much. We'll be back in a moment with Dr. James Manicom. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back to the program. James, I wonder if we could come back to the project that you're involved with. And you've given us a, a great overview of the region and some of the challenges facing the region. To what extent can countries like Canada and Australia influence the future direction of regional governance, uh, particularly in the area of security governance? That's a good question. I think when it comes to influencing the trajectory of security governance, um, one of the findings of our report is that the Canadians are behind the eight ball a little bit. Uh, the Australians underwent, I think, a sea change, or they underwent a national debate about Asia uh, over the 1990s and 2000s. And I was in Australia between 2004 and 2009. I saw this debate happening. They were, as a country that was Anglo-Saxon in a sea of, of, of the Pacific and of, surrounded by, by Asian countries, uh, they had a debate about whether they're an Asian country or a European country that's far from home. They concluded they're European, an, an Asian country, uh, and they began to engage Asia on Asia's terms. And that's important because, you know, for a long time they didn't engage Asia on Asia's terms. They uh, engaged in things like uh, Asia's very sensitive to interference in other countries' affairs, and Australia would, would, would from time to time do that. Um, and in East, their UN-backed intervention in East Timor. Uh, sort of wasn't welcomed by parts of Asia because it was an intervention in Indonesia, although Indonesia did uh, allow it to happen. But that was the beginning of, 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 a, of a, a new Australian relationship with Asia, which got better after 9-11 and after the Bali bombings in 2002 when Australian and Indonesian law enforcement officers cooperated to catch the people responsible. So Australia's had this debate about Asia, and they are, they are, they've doubled down. Um, as a consequence, they're a member of the East Asian Summit. They're a member of the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus as a consequence of that. Canada, by contrast, right around the same time, kind of pulled back from Asia. We were quite prolific in Asia in the 1990s. We were instrumental in the formation of the ARF, instrumental in, in building uh, a series of talks on the South China Sea, even instrumental in creating the, 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 the mechanism that, create, that led to the Six Party Talks. Those are all Canadian inventions that no one knows about. We sort of pulled back from the region for a variety of reasons. I think the main reason is budget cuts. You can't be everywhere. Uh, and there was a decision by the Canadian government to target foreign aid, which is where the money for all this was coming from, and foreign affairs aid uh, money uh, to Canada's own region, Latin America. You can't fault them for that. Uh, but certainly, uh, 
Asia is a region where FaceTime matters, and Canada is perceived to have not invested that FaceTime. So when it comes to Australia and Canada on uh, efforts to build security governance in the region, Canada's almost a step behind Australia. And the Australians aren't excited to go out and stick their neck out and, 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 and lobby on behalf of Canada for, Canadian to, for, for Canada to join the adjacent summit. I think if Canada were offered a spot, the Australians would support it. But the Australians who are only just, you know, rejoined Asia in their own right aren't going to stick their neck out for Canada. So Canada, if it wants to contribute to security governance, needs to find, needs to find champions within ASEAN. And I think, we're, 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 I think our government's actually working on that. Um, but nevertheless, you know, if we did also find that if Canada and Australia were uh, uh, both equally involved in security governance, well, then the overlaps and the commentaries between the two of them are, are absolutely fantastic. You know, uh, we can do a number of things that support our own interests and also regional interests. One thing's on human smuggling, right, which is an important issue for the Australians, which they have to de deal a lot with and deal in a very sensitive way because, of course, these are their neighbors. Um, one thing Canada can do that would support Australia, and that would be to key message um, Asian countries in the same way that Australia does, right? So there'd be another voice in the, of Australian interest in the region because our interests are broadly co compatible on that point. Um, something that Australia and Canada can do, uh, which Australians have already started to do with the Chinese, is to begin to hold military exercises with the Chinese. Um, the Australian Navy conducts naval exercises with the Chinese Navy, and I think, and our report certainly found that. Uh, the Canadian Navy could offer to do the same thing if, in fact, we could get ships to the Pacific. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. One, the Canadian Navy is the most inter interoperable Navy in the world with the United States. Uh, so any lessons that China learns from us could be uh, readily transferable to the United States. That's a mixed blessing, of course, because there's an intelligence problem there. Uh, uh, but certainly, if, if the Chinese and the Americans are reluctant to build defense ties, military ties between the two of them, uh, because those ties are hostage to developments across the Taiwan Strait in a variety of other ways, uh, that might be an opportunity for uh, an, uh, an area where Canada and Australia can, can, can reinforce or support regional stability by building basically bridges between two you know, superpowers and a great power, or whatever you want to call them. Um, there are other ways that Canada and Australia can alleviate just the general security condition in, in East Asia. Uh, one thing we found was that both Canada and Australia are resource exporters, as I mentioned. Something Canada could do, and the Australians could follow, we could do it in partnership even, is to extend basically Article 6, NAFTA Article 6 guarantee, so the guarantee that we will not interfere in our resource markets, basically a guarantee of exports uh, uh, under, or a guarantee of market conditions uh, for exports to East Asia and to Asia-Pacific countries. Um, that would probably go a long way to softening some of the anxiety about energy security in that country. Natural gas demand in, that in, in, in Asia is set to skyrocket because the Japanese have turned off their nuclear reactors after their natural disaster, or after the tsunami and subsequent nuclear disaster. Um, so natural gas prices will, will, will spike in, in, uh, uh, dramatically, which will increase put pressure on wages and exports and all kinds of things. So that's something we can do as well, and that's, you know, that's also in our commercial interest. Um, finally, there are a few, uh, a few things that Canada and Australia can do bilaterally. Uh, uh, we could improve our own dialogue on Asian security issues. Canada just, just announced last week that Canada and the United States now have a strategic dialogue on Asia-Pacific security. Uh, the United States has also um, started one of those with the Europeans. I think it's probably appropriate that if Canada decides that, in fact, our future is linked with the Asia-Pacific, uh, that it's probably appropriate for us to begin to have a bilateral dialogue, a formal one at the ministerial or deputy ministerial level, on security issues in the region, because there's nobody more better attuned to security in Asia than that of the Australians. Right. So you've, you've demonstrated that there are both areas where it is in our self-interest to cooperate, yeah. uh, but then also a lot of areas where there is direct competition between mm -hmm. Canada and Australia. Mm -hmm. um, are these mutually exclusive? Can, is, is it possible to have a coherent, uh, coordinated outlook on regional security? Uh, yeah, I think it is. I mean, any competition between Canada and Australia is bound to be friendly competition. Um, uh, and, you know, so, we, you know, it, it depends on the issue area and what the incentives are. I mean, as I said, there's an inherent commercial incentive for us uh, to cooperate with the Australians when it comes to, say, energy exports, even though, um, because the demand will be, will, will be sufficient to, 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 uh, to support uh, exports from both countries. Now, whether our gas can get out of North America is an entirely separate question. Um, uh, but certainly, uh, there's a way there for Canada and Australia to uh, 
to, to provide stability, right, of, or, or which, you know, supply stability and assurance, right? So that's important. Um, and certainly when it comes to, to uh, building confidence in the region, I think the Australians probably appreciate the fact that Canada's involved. Uh, Canada is, for whatever, uh, whatever the lamentations that have been in Canada about our declining role internationally, that's, in my experience in our conversations in Asia, that has not, that message hasn't reached them. Asian countries and Asian policymakers still see Canada as a globally competent, globally literate power. Uh, and so one area where Canada uh, could probably do a bit more is engaging Asian countries on their global aspirations. You know, Korea has articulated, formally articulated a middle power foreign policy, which is something that we used to do. Um, the Japanese have uh, clearly want to become more active on peacekeeping operations and those kinds. Those are things, that, those are areas of Canadian competency. Um, and finally, you know, there, is, there are just straight up instrumental reasons for Canada and Australia uh, where we could sort of share the burden and, and cut costs. One thing is on procurement. They're going to build diesel submarines. We're going to build offshore patrol vessels. One of the things our report suggests is we could, to extend the product, the production lifelines, we could buy Australian submarines. They could buy Canadian offshore patrol vessels. Great. Well, thank you very much. We're out of time, but this has been absolutely fascinating. And thank you to our audience for watching. Please join us again for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Days in mining and in services and things like that. Anyway, the forum uh, has asked CG, uh, uh, and particularly Ben Hampson, our Director of Global Security, uh, to, to, to produce a report that looks at security cooperation, because they don't often talk about the security dimension of the Australia-Canada relationship, which is, um, I think, one of the underexplored areas of possible cooperation between Canada and Australia, who are so similar in so many ways. So that's where the impetus came from. We partnered, we looked for an Australian uh, uh, partner or peer think tank uh, uh, to CG that could help us work on the Australian end. We came up with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, or ASPE, uh, who are based in, in, in Canberra and uh, uh, focused primarily on security and defense stuff, procurement issues, uh, Asia-Pacific security, those kinds of things. So in cooperation with Peter Jennings, who's their, uh, their, uh, their executive director, I think he's called, uh, is his title, uh, uh, we've had two meetings um, so far. One in Singapore, where we convened a meeting between Australian experts, Canadian experts, uh, as well as some experts from Southeast Asia uh, uh, at the Shangri-La Hotel in Singapore, right after the Shangri-La Dialogue, which is a very important uh, track 1.5 security meeting in the region. We piggybacked off that, had a very productive meeting. Uh, to discuss security cooperation between Canada and Australia in Southeast Asia. And then in, we met again in Seoul in October uh, and had a meeting uh, hosted by a Korean think tank called the Asan Institute about Canada, Australia, and Korean cooperation uh, uh, in Northeast Asia and exploring the Northeast Asian uh, element of, of... Every week on the show, we invite an expert in the areas of international public policy, global governance, or some other aspect of international affairs here to the studio at the Center for International Governance and Innovation in Waterloo. Today I'm joined by Dr. James Manicom. Dr. Manicom is a research fellow here at CG. He's an authority on East Asian international relations, on Arctic security and governance, and on maritime security and governance. He's also a contributor to a new project that CG has undertaken in partnership with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute on Canada-Australia security cooperation in the Asia-Pacific region. James, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I thought we'd start the episode by talking a little bit about the project. And the broad aim... the issues, I speak to James Manicom about Canada-Australia's security cooperation in the Asia-Pacific region. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and program officer at the Balsley School of International Affairs. Our aims are to explore ways in which Canada-Australia can enhance their partnership, particularly in the area of defense and security cooperation yes, in Asia-Pacific. 
Um, can you speak a little bit about the project, its scope, and what the intended outcomes might be? Yeah, we uh, the project uh, is uh, going to produce a report for the Australia Canada Economic Leadership Forum, which is a uh, uh, a biannual meeting of of industry, of government, of the private sector. Uh, it takes place alternating between Canada and Australia. Uh, and they talk about Australia, the scope of Australia and Canadian political and economic cooperation. And there's a lot of companies that do business in, in, in both countries, and, and the two economies are both complementary and competitive in different ways.